So Lachlan Fleetwood is an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellow at University College uh, Dublin. Um, and before that, he did a PhD in history at the University of Cambridge on uh, the vertical globe, altitude and science uh, in the Himalayas during the 19th century. So that was his PhD. At University College Dublin, he's, he's developed a new project on environmental determinism in imperial surveys of Central Asia and Mesopotamia, taking in another vast region. Uh, parts of his doctoral research uh, on scientific instruments, altitude physiology and mountains have been published in various journals. You may have seen the papers in the history of science, itinerario and notes and records. And very happily, he has a book about to appear in uh, May or June, published by Cambridge University Press, entitled Science on the Roof of the World, Empire and the Remaking of the Himalaya. And you may talk, say something a little about that book in a moment. So welcome, Aglachlan, to the seminar. Your title, as I have it, and please feel free to correct it, is Empire on High, Mountains, Measurement and the World Altitude Record in the 19th Century. Back up. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction, Felix, and thanks to you and to Jonathan for uh, inviting me to speak today, indeed to all of the uh, conveners of the London Group of Historical Geographers. Um, and I should say it's a real pleasure to be included here in this series on mountains as the various ways that historical geographers and historians have looked at mountains and mountain spaces um, informs most, if not all of my work in various ways. I'm just going to go ahead and put up my slides now. So that should be fine. Um, so, okay, the talk that I'm going to give today arises out of the research that Felix just mentioned, which was part of my doctorate uh, and now book uh, with the title Science on the Roof of the World, uh, which should be out in uh, late May or early June. Uh, you can see the lovely uh, cover here on the slide. And so in this book, then, I am looking at a broad story of global comparison in imperial uh, environments on scientific understandings of the Himalaya. And among other questions, I ask how altitude became central to understanding scientific, uh, various scientific phenomena in the 19th century. I look at how global comparisons, especially the Alps and the Andes, shaped environmental uh, imaginaries in the Himalaya. I look at how these fueled concern around the blank spaces at the edges of the East India Company's rapidly expanding empire in South Asia. And finally, I also look at how the various reconfigurations of the mountains were uh, contested by the Himalayan peoples that surveyors and naturalists relied on in the mountains. And so in answering these questions then, in the book I'm ultimately trying to offer uh, an innovative way to understand what we might think of as a global history of science. And ultimately one of the things I highlight is the rise of verticality as an important framework for understanding uh, scientific phenomena, and in doing so highlight the need to pay attention to disconnection, breakdown, failure, uh, as much as connection and disconnection in the imperial remaking of supposedly universal categories, something like as large as mountains. Uh, and so using this approach then, I'm trying to demonstrate how mountains come to be seen in the 19th century as environmentally marginal spaces and think about the consequences of this, for the relationship of Himalayan peoples to uh, both empire and to post-colonial South Asian states. Uh, and in turn then use these um, arguments to reflect on geographical features themselves as scales for histories that might transcend traditional national and area studies framings. So using mountains in some of the similar ways that scholars have recently been using oceans, islands and beaches. Okay, so I, I thought I'd just get the, the sort of shameless uh, self-promotion out of the way early, uh, but rather than just talking about the book and the book project today, I actually want to zoom in on one thread that comes out of this research, uh, that is, as my title says, the sometimes convoluted, often bombastic history of the so-called world altitude record. So that is the highest point on the surface that has been reached by humans. And so although this comes out of the previous work, it's the story that I'm following today and, and has ended up expanding quite considerably, um, most notably temporally in that the book project finished in the 1850s. Um, and I'm going to be talking all the way into the early 20th century um, 
And so this is mostly new material, uh, questions that I'm still working through. So at the end, any reading suggestions and feedback, et cetera, all uh, very, very much welcome. So, okay, in the time that I've got today, then I wanna take a look at some of the various moments in the history of the altitude record, including that involving East India Company surveyors, James and Alexander Gerard, whose high point uh, during a survey of Mount Rio Pergil in the Himalaya, uh, which they reached in 1818, was likely just slightly higher than the Prussian polymath, Alexander von Humboldt had reached on Chimborazo in South America in 1802. We'll also look at William Woodman Graham's Bex descent of Mountain Cabrew in 1883. We'll turn to the well-known mountaineer, William Martin Conway, and the prolific Swiss guide, Matthias Zerbringen, and their ascent of the Pioneer Peak in 1892. Uh, and we'll finish with the ascent of Tom Longstaff, the Brockerall brothers, and the Gurkha guide, Kabia Burotoki, on Trissel in 1907. One feature all of the ascents that I've just mentioned have in common is that they were made by men. Uh, but at the end of the talk, I'll also briefly consider the efforts of Fanny Bullock Workman, an American climber who in, in 1906 claimed the women's altitude record and very nearly made this the outright altitude record. Another key feature of all these various record ascents I've mentioned is that uh, most of them were found uh, to subsequently never have been the case. So in the case of the Humboldt, uh, of Humboldt and the Girard brothers, uh, this is because of the discovery in the 1990s of the frozen bodies of Inca sacrifices at a higher altitude uh, than they'd reached on the summit of Liloaco in South America. Um, and these discoveries then definitively show that the records that, the hum that Humboldt and the Gerards thought they had uh, were never actually the case. Uh, it's, of course, um, quite possible that Himalayan people had been higher at those times as well. In other cases, the records were doubted. So as in the case of William Woodman Graham's ascent of Cabrew, uh, his fairly woeful grasp of geography led to suggestions that he may have climbed the wrong mountain and actually been climbing on an entirely different mountain to the one he thought he'd been. In other cases, um, including those of Conway and Workman, uh, these doubts are more mundane. So they were based on shaky uh, instrumental measurements, which were subsequently downgraded. So in a way, it's an arbitrary record. Um, and as these various doubts, downgradings indicate, the world record, altitude record uh, was always a fraught category. Um, and in particular, any claims to the record tend to be complicated by the very great difficulty of measuring altitude accurately uh, using portable instruments, something that's still ongoing even in the early 20th century. And this is perhaps one reason then why the altitude record never becomes a formalized competition, um, at least until Everest is the sort of real possibility, uh, or one that quite uh, captures the attention of the public in the same way as, as at the same time, the, the race for the uh, poles. That being said, this notion of an altitude record is frequently mentioned, um, especially towards the end of the 19th century, even if the proprietary of actually chasing the record or openly admitting to doing so uh, was often in question. And so the different ways then that climbers discuss, doubt, um, celebrate or, or not celebrate the record in their accounts, uh, later in talks with the Royal Geographical Society especially, and sometimes dispatches to the press, uh, provides an interesting way to think about some questions about knowledge making at the edge of the British Empire. Um, and so in particular, record setting seeking expeditions allow us to think also about some of the technical and social challenges of measuring mountains, as well as the place of records in the history of exploration and geography as a discipline. Even more widely, and, and probably the, the most interesting thing uh, for me is the way that these claims point to an increasingly widely accepted standardization of altitude as a category that makes mountains important, at least from initially the perspective of Western science, and from those of us in the present. And so the history of the altitude record then is, is a reminder that neither altitude in general or altitude above sea level in particular are wholly natural categories. Um, and so it's something that has to be insisted on as making um, some mountains matter more than others. Uh, whereas in the earlier period, as uh, Jason Koenig uh, told us last week, uh, other, other categories, so maybe aesthetics, location, um, association with religious or 
uh, historical events uh, were often used to dis uh, as ascribe uh, significance to mountains, uh, especially in a period where accurate altitude measurements were anyway essentially impossible. Okay, so as I said, for the purpose of the talk, I've decided to stop with Trissel in 1907, uh, although this record is broken again soon after um, the Duke of Abruzzi, I think in 1909. There are a number of other claimants then before the successful summit of Mount Everest in 1953 renders the whole concept of an altitude record redundant. And so in uh, considering this earlier period, I won't be saying very much about the better known uh, and well-studied mountaining exped uh, expeditions that made Everest the main prize. So for example, the disappearance of Mallory and Irvine in the 1920s or, or Tenzing and Hillary's eventual successful ascent. Um, and so in, I'll be focusing on the early period when questions about the altitude record have rarely been looked at together or in their own terms, but I'm nevertheless drawing on, on uh, quite a, a lot of actually excellent recent work on mountaineering um, in the Himalaya and elsewhere. So work with people like Peter Bayers, and Coley, Morris Eisenman and Stuart Weaver, especially work by uh, Peter Hansen shows among other things how in the Himalaya, this desire to climb to summits came into conflict with British uh, imperial ideas of a, of a scientific um, and political frontier. And I'm also drawing on, um, there's been for, for obvious reasons with the, the um, anniversary coming up, focus on Everest. There's been some good work recently as well on early attempts on Everest by people like Julie Rack, um, Paul Gilchrist, and of course, John Westway, uh, whose paper later in the series I'm really looking forward to. Okay, so that's, that's probably enough um, or more than enough of a preamble. Um, I now want to turn to look at some of these uh, altitude record setting expeditions in a bit more detail. So we might begin, um, as many of those who examined mountains in the 19th century did, with Alexander von Humboldt, whose Andean legacy shaped the science of mountains and mountaineering for decades. And he reached, by his own estimation, the world altitude record at the as I said, in 1802, during his famous ascent of the volcano Chimborazo um, in what is now Ecuador. And I put this image on the slide. It's one that I keep coming back to. Um, it's a comparative tableau of all of the world's mountains and rivers, at least um, such as they were known uh, in 1836 when the image was produced. So it's not particularly easy to see at this scale, um, but the kind of most uh, central mountain is, I'm not sure if you can see the cursor, but it's Chimborazo. Uh, and Himbo, uh, Humboldt's uh, famous ascent there is marked on the side of, of the volcano. Um, it's also probably not that easy to see at this scale, but slightly higher and to the right of Chimborazo is a hot air balloon. And this is Gay Lussac in his famous ascent uh, over Paris to 23,000 feet in 1804. And I just point that out as a reminder that. Uh, even in the early 19th century, balloonists had been higher than climbers. Um, and so uh, sometimes there was a uh, comparison between the, between the two forms of, of altitude. So uh, physiologists, for instance, in the later 19th century, looking at hypoxia or some of the similar um, effects of altitude sickness, uh, but for the most part, they're kept separate. And the, the history of this record I'm talking about today is a terrestrial one. It's also uh, worth emphasizing that in 1802, when Humboldt made his record, or record as the case may be, ascent of Chimborazo, he thought it was the highest mountain in the world, as did many others. Uh, and the Himalaya were only finally accepted as, as higher than the Andes, sort of in the 1810s, more widely by the 1820s. And the, the title of highest mountain in the world uh, shifts relatively rapidly in this period as well. So it goes from Chimborazo to Dalagiri, uh, possibly Nanda Devi, Kanchanchanga, and finally Everest only in the 1850s, um, which is sort of the story that I'm, that I'm telling in the book. Uh, and this image then gives us kind of a similar sense of the, the changing shape of what I call the vertical globe um, as, as, a, as, as one indication, Dalagiri is here uh, depicted as the highest of the Himalaya um, and therefore the highest mountain in the world uh, as far as it was believed at this time. So, okay, Humboldt's record was very likely broken uh, by, as I said, the East India Company officer, Alexander Girard, and his brother James, who ascended to a high point on Rio Pergil, uh, 
um, during a survey in 1818. And they got to about 100 feet higher, probably, um, than Humboldt had gotten, something that Humboldt himself later perhaps slightly grudgingly acknowledges. Uh, Gerard's account, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, account of the ascent is a fairly minimalist one. Uh, he, he writes this. Uh, he says, after much annoyance, we reached the place where we put up the barometer yesterday. Here the man who carried the bundle of sticks sat down and said he must die, uh, as he could not proceed a step further. And neither threats nor the promise of a handsome reward could induce him to move. Uh, we accordingly left him, and after an ascent of 700 feet, attained the top of the peak, 19,411 feet above the level of the sea. Uh, this is kind of interesting in it implies that the porters have given up and that the European uh, surveyors had traveled to their record height alone. In reality, the brothers were accompanied by several Tartars, we don't know how many, um, and Humboldt had simply been accompanied by a Mestizo guide. So none of these records were, were made uh, alone, uh, which is something, a thread that I'll pick up on a little bit later in the talk. What's also notable about this ascent is that it came with very little fanfare. Um, Gerard did note that it was the highest point in the world, uh, as he records in a mem memorandum that he sent back with the map that they'd produced of the survey. He says, I've, uh, I've discussed the elevation of the station at some length uh, because the subject is interesting from the circumstance of no former travelers having attained such a height on the Earth's surface. It's also interesting that this ascent then was not to the summit of a, a major mountain. Uh, and indeed many of these early uh, claims, the altitude record, including Humboldt's, included not to the actual summits or tops of mountains, but to either high points or passes crossed during uh, surveys. And the Drads then were climbing, uh, not for sport, uh, but as part of East India Company duties to map an increasingly insecure political frontier uh, for the British Empire in India. And they're not in any kind of modern sense than mountaineers, even though mountaineering itself is, is starting to pick up as a sporting pursuit in the Alps. In this period, there was actually uh, considerable doubt as to whether the highest summits, uh, if they knew what the highest summits were, would ever be reached, uh, even if this was considered to be something that was desirable. Um, in particular, the pursuit of uh, altitude was, uh, rather than science, was seen as a somewhat dubious activity. As Humboldt uh, points out, he already chides other uh, climbers in the mid 19th, uh, yeah, mid 19th century. Uh, these mountain ascents beyond the line of perpetual snow, um, however much they may engage the curiosity of the public, are, he says, of very little scientific utility. And this is an ongoing tension when it comes to climbing mountains, especially in the Himalaya. So, following the Drards, then, the French chemist and traveler Jean Baptiste Boussignol. Uh, in the Andes in the 1830s, as well, uh, Joseph Dalton Hooker in the Himalaya in the 1840s, both went very high to around the same height as the Drads and Humboldt, probably um, also higher. It wasn't until the German Schlagenweit brothers uh, climb of Kamet, so a secondary summit of the mountain Abi Garmin in the Himalaya or the Karakoram uh, in August 1855, climbed to 22,259 feet. And this then was the first ascent that definitely exceeded any of the now verifiable ascents made by uh, Inca or in the Andes. It's possible that Himalayan or Andean people, of course, had still been higher. In the 1860s, um, another series of ascents were added to the ledger by uh, a surveyor, William Johnson, uh, another of these imperial cadre, uh, possibly also a, a Kailasi, so a survey assistant in his employ. Uh, and they made various ascents that might have been records, um, although some of them were on mountains that were later drastically downgraded. Um, and so although the Johnson climbs are something that later mountaineering commentators, especially around the early, early 20th century, picked up on, they weren't really discussed at the time um, in the context of, of being altitude records. Perhaps it reflects a limited perceived value of claiming the record, but it's probably more broadly uh, an ongoing indication of the sheer difficulty of measuring altitude uh, in these climbs accurately enough to, to actually claim the record. So later then, the mountaineer and geographer Douglas Freshfield wants to emphasize that these climbing efforts by imperial surveyors like, like the Drad brothers and Johnson are part of a different era. And so as he writes, 
Anglo-Indians seldom climb in the technical sense of the word. The mountaineering practice layer, however spirited of its kind, has not, as a rule, been mountaineering at all in the European sense of the word. There have been many explorers, but few mountain climbers. Um, of course, in defining it this way, he's also trying to clear up space for the new uh, sporting sense that are now forthcoming and that he's a part of. So moving uh, further forward still then, uh, this new sporting ethos is perhaps best illustrated by the case of William Woodman Graham, who made uh, several ascents in the Himalayan 1880s, including on Cabru, as I mentioned, to a supposedly record altitude of 23,700 feet in 1883. And Graham was one of the first, by his own estimation, to visit for sport. Uh, so to this end, he brought with him Swiss guides, uh, Joseph Imberden and Emil Boss. And this is kind of the beginning of, initially at least, of importing European experts. Um, and as, as Graham somewhat apologetically said in a talk, which he later gave to the Royal Geographical Society about his travels and his climbs, he says, to my shame, perhaps, I went to India uh, more for sport and adventures than for the advancement of scientific knowledge. And so Graham's trip uh, is by many then considered to be the first sort of modern mountaineering expedition to the Himalaya. On the other hand, the altitude record that came with this uh, or this uh, expedition uh, has attracted a uh, fairly considerable doubt. Um, part of the intrigue was that during, uh, or is that in Graham's account of the climb, he claims to suffer practically nothing of altitude sickness. So as he recounts then of the ascent of Cabru, Headaches, bleeding uh, at the nose, temporary loss of sight and hearing were conspicuous only by their absence. Unquestionably, man's range is increasing. Read any old account of an ascent of Mont Blanc, it was expected that the climber should suffer every possible inconvenience from rarefied air and the harrowing details of heart duly forthcoming. Now the ascent is mere child's prey uh, and we hear no more of these agonizing horrors. Um, this might partly then have reflected changing tropes about admitting uh, or around masculine weakness and, and admitting to weakness. Um, for example, uh, the French physiologist Paul Baer uh, suggested that by the 1860s, uh, he, he wrote a historical account um, compiling accounts of altitude things from all around the world. And he, he suggests that by, by the sort of 1860s, mountaineers are almost afraid as being ridiculed for mountain sickness as they were for sea sickness. And so he goes on and formally they sorted symptoms for themselves. They like to boast of having experienced them, uh, but today they refuse to observe them or admit them. Um, sometimes they deny them altogether. So the other, this was one issue with Graham's uh, account of Cabru, and the other was that his kind of very vague descriptions and generally pretty mediocre uh, sense of geographical organization led to suggestions that he might have actually been climbing on an entirely different mountain to the one that he thought he climbed. Later authorities, though, were somewhat more forgiving. Um, J. Norman Coley, for example, another of the sort of early 20th century mountaineering commentators, saw no reason to disbelieve uh, that Graham had made a significant ascent. Um, and this is especially because uh, by that time uh, it had been similar feats had been done that showed that other climbers at similar altitudes could climb at a similar pace without undue detriment. Uh, and Douglas Freshfield, for example, suggests that it, Graham's ascent were made too early. Uh, they were uh, 25 years ago, sorry, they were ridiculed in India and they're still disbelieved by many people. And he says this is to a great extent Mr. Graham's fault. He describes his uh, travels without any precision uh, in detail, which is effective of a modern explorer. Um, that being said, as another uh, British mountaineer and publisher named Arnold Mom picked up, he says, uh, while the in the earlier period, questions of a or the world's record for altitude is something that's explicitly range, uh, raised. Since uh, 1883, when Graham did or did not get up Cabru, it has excited more or less continuous interest. So following uh, Graham then, the next major flirtation with the record was a well-backed and resourced expedition led by the mountaineer, um, art critic, and later politician, William Martin Conway in 1892. We see Conway on the slide, uh, as well as two of those who accompanied him, 
the Swiss guide Matthias Zerbrigen, who sort of shows up in, in various of these altitude record ascents, uh, climbed all over the world, uh, also made this, the, the first ascent, I believe, of Aconcagua in 1897. Uh, if uh, Graham's ascent of Cabrou never actually was to the height that he thought it was, then that would have briefly moved the altitude record uh, from the Himalaya back to the Andes. Um, but we will we'll probably never know for sure. I also accompanied by Charles Granville Bruce, an officer in a Gurkha regiment, um, who is involved in, in a, a significant number of these early, uh, 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 early altitude record uh, expeditions, all the way through until British attempts on, on Everest, even in, in the 1820s, is still uh, going uh, for, the, for the record. And so in writing about the, the expedition, Bruce claims that uh, Conway never made any pretension of conducting a purely mountaineer expedition, had far wider aims. Uh, for those days, uh, the Karakoram was but little known. Uh, but he goes on to confess that uh, it was doubtless Conway's aim uh, to get uh, in any climbs that he could manage on the way. And we hoped also to make an attempt on the altitude record if such a thing was possible. So Conway's party uh, did manage to summon a minor mountain in 1892, which they then dubbed the Pioneer Peak and which their measurements indicated was a new high point on the Earth's surface for the human body. Uh, we see a, a depiction of this ascent here. Um, the, the image is interesting and in it shows that this tension is it's, they're still very much foregrounding the imperial surveying uh, dimensions of these uh, expeditions. So the, the kind of plane table is, is the front and centre um, and the scientific, ex, uh, it, it, the scientific contributions are still, are still kind of uh, shown to be the most, uh, the most important uh, aspect. That being said, the measurements that they made on Pioneer Peak were quite, uh, quite limited and they were soon downgraded. Um, so this was never, never an altitude record um, and it kind of shows how these continue to be vexed by the difficulties of instrumental measurement. So after Conway then, the next uh, claimant to the altitude record was the English doctor and explorer Tom Longstaff along with the Swiss Brockwell brothers and the guide at uh, Kabia uh, Buritoki on the mountain Tristle in 1907. See uh, on the slide here, an image that they took uh, from the summit. Um, interest, Longstaff's, uh, his account of this record uh, climb is quite interesting, especially if we compare it to Graham's in that he readily admits to bodily weakness. So he writes, uh, during the ascent, my breathing was very rapid and I felt very feeble, but I was securely tied onto the rope and could not escape. I began to doubt my capacity to maintain the pace much longer, uh, but Alexis and Carbia uh, seemed quite happy and Henry offered to pull on my rope as much as I liked. Uh, so I pocketed my pride and consented to this breach of the rules. Um, so it's not, not necessarily particularly flattering to Longstaff, um, but it also sort of indicates how uh, the or the different ways that suffering bodily weakness uh, and willingness to admit to them uh, in this pursuit of altitude changed uh, across the 19th century or in, in different contexts. So uh, Arnold Mum, uh, who I uh, briefly mentioned earlier, accompanied this expedition, um, but he remained at base camp in this case because of illness. Um, and he goes on to write about the record, perhaps false modesty uh, all around, uh, he says, uh, it's impossible to keep away here from the subject of records. Longstaff detests them. So I feel bound to say what his family declined to say himself, that the summit of Tristle was then the highest point on the Earth's surface, uh, which had been reached by man beyond all doubt, or controversy, uh, and it still remains the highest mountain in the world of which a complete ascent is undisputed. So this is an ind indication then in the, in the kind of the, the sort of as I said, false modesty, that the kind of proprietary of chasing these records or openly admitting to chasing the records is something that's still debated. Um, Douglas Freshfield, for example, noted uh, after comments made at the Royal Geographical Society, uh, uh, comments after a paper describing Longstaff's descent, um, that he says, I was born before records were invented. And if an old mountaineer may give advice to his younger friends, I would strongly recommend him to follow Longstaff's example not to insist too much on records and to think more of getting to the tops of their peaks uh, and less of getting higher than their rivals. 
Okay, so Longstaff and the Rockerall brothers and Carbier's uh, record on Trestle was broken quite soon afterwards, um, but this is where I'm going to leave the chronological story for now. Um, and indeed, um, I'm looking forward to other, other speakers later in the series picking up on, on the story as, as Area starts to loom as a, as a real possibility and as a personal and political goal. Instead, I want to pivot now and look at the way that the Senate of Trestle, uh, Trestle point, uh, provides us with a good opportunity to think about the role of South Asian guides in uh, most, if not all, of these record setting ascents. Um, so none of these expeditions traveled alone, uh, and even in the climbing parties, they always included a combination of aristocratic, sometimes middle class men in the role of expedition leader, but also uh, South Asian and then sometimes Swiss guides. And so these climbs are never uh, carried out then in spaces that aren't always uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial in makeup. Uh, and there's been some really, really good uh, work on these relationships by likes of Peter Hansen um, and also by uh, Sherry Orton on the show. So as an example then of these relationships, we might look at the Gurkha guides, Hakia Tapa uh, and Kabia Buritoki, both of whom had long careers climbing together with various of the altitude uh, record expeditions. Uh, and whose names then are, are indelibly a part of this early history of Himalayan mountaineering. Uh, and we see portraits of, of the two men here. Uh, this is from relatively early in their careers. Uh, portraits are included in Conway's uh, book from 1894. And so as Charles Bruce goes on to explain, uh, the two Gurkhas who accompanied Conway in his final trip through the DAC were the before mentioned uh, Harkbeer and a young, younger man, Kabir Rotoki. Um, and so he says this, this trip then began for him and Harkia, a companionship of the mountains, which lasted for many years. The younger man uh, finally overtopping Harkia in his achievements. For 15 years later, it was the same Kabia Birotoki that was with Dr. Longstaff on the first descent of Trissel. Uh, Bruce himself uh, maintained a, a long association with Harkia, arranged at one point to bring him to climb in the Alps, and they also climbed in Scotland and had uh, at least, according to Bruce, uh, altogether uh, one of, he, he writes, I think the most enjoyable times of our life. Um, and this kind of cross-cultural uh, homosociality involved in these mountaineering records expand, extends then beyond just this time where they're bound up in the Brotherhood of the Rope. Um, so much mountaineering then is now involved sitting around in camp, waiting for a break in the weather, preparing equipment, for et cetera. Um, and so these kind of the limited supplies, freezing conditions, cramped tents mean that um, kind of rigid uh, segregation is much harder, if that seems desirable, to maintain than, than it was in the lowlands. Um, and as one example, uh, Tom Longstaff notes that uh, just five days before their record breaking climb of Trissel, a storm has uh, swept in. And as a result, we could not stay outside the tents, he writes, so passed the day in dragging, uh, smoking and dragging out Carbia's reminiscences of war. He's been in 40 affairs and is great on bullet wounds. He takes a sensible view of war and fights to hurt. Um, he goes on, I fear mum had a very uh, dull time alone in his tent. So in this instance then, a European and a South Asian apparently spend the day swapping manly tales of fighting. Um, although whether uh, this is an example of social and ritual hierarchy is breaking down is a much more open question. Um, especially as our perspective on this homosexuality is, is only one-sided, um, Kabir leaves uh, in this case no doubt. So much then uh, as in attempts to separate and classify the early efforts of surveyors and their climbs, there were sometimes, uh, or there were concerted efforts to insist that these South, South Asian guides were not uh, mountaineers in a modern sense, at least not without sophisticated European training. Charles Bruce, for example, argues that among the Himalayan tribes, this still remains an unknown craft. There are from one end of the Himalaya to the other, splendid mountaineers in the natural and not in the educated modern sense. Men of the greatest possible stamina and activity and sure-footedness, but men who are filled with the terror of the greatest summits in different degrees. So here he discusses climbing and civilizational uh, racial terms, uh, a, a decent pinch of environmental determinism thrown in as well. And he goes on to suggest that climbing mountains it was not always seen 
uh, is desirable. Um, and he, he sort of suggests in his terms that the kind of intellect, intellectual splendor of pursuing higher summits is something that wasn't easily explained. Um, and he goes on to say there's today been little to, to egg Mon until quite, quite recent years. I had a struggle for the conquest of peaks, which to their minds leads to nothing, is terribly dangerous and may involve uh, supernatural disasters into the bargain. Um, so much as in kind of other colonial spheres at this point, it implies that South Asians need a European guiding hand it's, and, and it's sort of reclaiming European ingenuity and agency in sculpting so-called natural mountaineering talent into effective practice. That would be one way to look at it. Um, the other though is a reminder that the precise altitude above sea level is, is only one way of assigning significance to mountains. Um, and so the most important or highest mountains, if you like, in South Asian traditions uh, are mountains of, of relatively moderate height, like Kailash, the uh, origin of the subcontinent's life-giving rivers, an important site of pilgrimage, including today, uh, or mythical, in the case of Meru, so the center of the world in cosmology, uh, and the mountains that are geographically the highest, like Everest, or the kind of more or less entirely obscure K2, um, mountains which require instrumentation to be legible as highest uh, were not seen as particularly important until European science begins valorizing altitude. Okay, so in the in the time then which I have left, I want to briefly look uh, at how the world altitude record and mountains of spaces for imperial uh, and sporting gestures changes towards the end of the century, uh, along times sometimes moody reflections on. Um, to use Joseph Conrad's terms, the, the age of geography triumphant, and this idea that there was a seemingly narrowing space uh, scope uh, for outdoor or imperial adventure, um, something that Felix, Felix Driver has, of course, written uh, very eloquently about. So Conway, uh, that is William Martin Conway, notes that as the last blank spaces in the maps are being filled in, high mountains, he suggests, are gonna have a growing role as spaces for imperial exploration and adventure. He wrote at the Royal Geographical Society, he'd been warned that he should avoid descriptions of mountaineering and too uh, much reference even to mountain exploration. Um, but he goes on before concluding, I should make so bold as to transgress into the region of prophecy and to affirm, affirm that it is the de destiny of the society to hear much more of mountains in the future than it's heard in the past. And this is because he says, the great bulk of the habitable parts of the world and even traversable deserts have now been explored. There are a few flat areas of any great extent um, that remain attractive to adventurers. The abodes of snow follow mountain al uh, alone stand forth to challenge exploration. It is not in the nature of man to decline this challenge. So ironically though, even as those seeking manly adventure were looking higher and higher at mountains, by the early 20th century, women like the American Fanny Bullock Workman were very nearly making the world's uh, out, or the, the women's world altitude record the outright world altitude record. So uh, Fanny Workman, uh, often with her husband William Hunter and the Swiss guide uh, Maria Serbian, who I mentioned earlier, uh, made a series of climbs then in the Himalaya between 1899 and 1912. Uh, we see two images on the slide here of Workman um, on the uh, one is a photograph of the glacier. Workman is the, feet, the silhouette closest to the center. We can see the skirt. She was climbed in a skirt. Um, similarly, also in the 1912 image, uh, which is a, a staged image uh, on the uh, silver throne um, with a kind of pamphlet that says votes for women. So in 1906, then at 47 years of age, she reached the top of Pinnacle Peak, um, a secondary summit of the mountain Nankan which at 22,700 feet was a new high point for women, um, breaking in fact her own previous record. Her husband, William, was on the expedition. He stayed on this occasion lower, uh, taking photographs, um, though he'd ostensibly been 100 feet higher on a different expedition in 1903. And so as in, in many of these cases, there's some confusion over the measurements. Uh, workmen thought that the height of Pinnacle Peak was actually over 23,000 feet. Um, but either way, it was the women's altitude record, and it was something that she vigorously defended, including against fellow American woman Annie Smith Peck, who in 1908 claims to have gone higher than workmen on Waskaran, uh, 
in Peru to a height of nearly 24,000 feet. In response, workmen um, at considerable expense sends a team of surveyors to measure the mountain and show that this was incorrect. She then sent off a letter to the editor of the Scientific American in 1910, laying out the problems with measurements of Huascaran um, as determined by the team of French surveyors she'd hired and concluding that Miss Peck's highest ascent to date therefore stands North Peak Huascaran 21,812 feet instead of 24,000 feet as she estimated it. And she has not the honor of breaking the world's record either for men or women as my two ascents are respectively higher. So despite some attempts then to preserve the highest mountains for mountain adventure or imperial homosociality, Franny's uh, Bullock Workman and Annie Smith Peck make it abundantly clear that women are just as capable and interested in taking part in this pursuit of altitude. Um, and this kind of slightly bombastic story is a reminder of the ongoing challenges of accurate measurement, uh, even as the kind of outright competition over the record is starting to become, um, come to the fore. So both Workman and Peck uh, mobilize the press for their causes. So Workman and her husband write uh, numerous books and articles, published up in their travels, and gave lectures across Europe. Fanny Bullock Workman has the slightly damning honor uh, of being the second woman to address the Royal Geographical Society in the grand year of 1905. She was though absent at the later address at the RGS, which discussed the ascent of Pinnacle Peak. Um, and in introducing this paper, the RGS president at the time, uh, George Tubman Goldie says, I regret, that Mrs. Workman has not been able to be here tonight, so we hope she would have been. She's engaged in something much more arduous than climbing, um, that is 23,000 feet. Uh, she's, she's delivering 30 lectures in 37 days, starting from Munich. Um, I'm sure many of you could sympathize. Um, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether giving 30 lectures or climbing mountains is more difficult. Um, Goldman continues uh, that he wouldn't uh, decide not to enter into the difficult question as to which traveller has ascended to the greatest height of sea level. We have Dr. Longstaff here. I believe there's only a matter of about 10 feet between them. Him, Dr. and Mrs. Workman. Uh, but I'll remind you that all of these explorers are not merely trying um, how high they can climb. Kepler observations and other scientific directions are ongoing. So this kind of tension between sporting and scientific climbs continues. Um, I'll just speed up a little bit now, I think. So um, the Surveyor and geographer Thomas Holditch uh, was also present, and he notes actually just how close to the actual outright record Fanny work, uh, Workman had gotten. And he says, You must know, for it's been frequently discussed in this hall, the difficulty exists in determining altitudes at such great heights. However, this, that may be, um, we must all of us accord our unmitigated admiration to the exploits of the lady who succeeded in exploring such inaccessible altitudes as Mrs. Bullock Workman has done. I think that even if it's impossible to say amongst the four or five people who have ascended higher than any other people in the world, which individual amongst them uh, actually achieved the proud position of getting highest, still we must agree that amongst those few, uh, Mrs. Bullock Workman certainly takes a prominent place. So he acknowledges that the difficulties of measuring, uh, but he also reminds us, as I think we should uh, very much keep in mind, that any conversation about the altitude record must include her name. Okay, so I think I'm probably about out of time and I should offer something uh, of a conclusion. Given the quite convoluted and inconsistent way the altitude record was measured, discussed, there's not too many straightforward claims that can be made. By the early 20th century, of course, uh, attention's already turned to Everest to pushing the altitude record to its logical conclusion um, and indeed to its redundancy by reaching the highest point above sea level. Um, so Bruce and Longstaff, for example, are planning out uh, Everest or thinking about Everest as early as 1906. Bruce eventually goes in the 1922 attempt, uh, although at this point it's more in an advisory than climbing capacity. And as actually, uh, interestingly, as Douglas Freshfield goes on to point out, tackling Everest uh, and the highest summits actually by default erases some of the problems with determining and claiming the altitude record. And he says, uh, now, to me, the next problem to be attacked, the ascent of the highest mountains in the world, will be more satisfactory uh, for those who attack it because adventurers who first shake hands on the top of one of the highest Himalayan peaks will have no doubt of their victory. Um, and so in, indeed, increasingly then, attention turns to the summits of mountains and, and major mountains whose elevations has been well-established by trigonometry, 
um, rather than just high points, as with the case of the Dryad Brothers or the case of Humboldt, or secondary summits like Workman's, or the ascent of kind of obscure bumps that were unnamed before being attached to a perhaps dubious uh, claim to a record, as in the case of Conway's Pioneer Peak. So in the paper then, I've tried to show sometimes ambivalent attachment to the altitude record is, is an interesting way of reflecting on technical and social challenges, scientific knowledge making the edge of empires, and just the difficulty of claiming a geographical feat that requires precision instrumentation to make it legible. Um, and so in these kind of vexed attempts, uh, we, we can see how different claims about geography, about sport, empire, and science might all collide. I also briefly use these uh, record setting expeditions as illustrations of how non-European guides uh, might provide both a foil and a challenge uh, to imperial mountaineering and how the tales of the likes of Harkby and Carby might be used to advance wider historical, historiographical debates so around imperial dependency uh, on cross-cultural or indigenous labor expertise. Um, or as I've, as I've shown in, in some of my other work, the various ways that mountains and mountain peoples in the 19th century particularly come to be seen as exceptional and sometimes aberrant spaces in comparison to normative environments of the lowlands. And finally then, the various and often contradictory accounts are a reminder that the valorization of altitude is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, and this is most uh, explicitly uh, embodied today, of course, in the increasingly chaotic and crowded commercial attempts to stand on the summit of Everest, the significance of which just happens to be that it's higher than any other piece of ground, and which is something that we have collectively decided matters. And so, the history of the altitude record then is a reminder that altitude above sea level is far from a self-evidently important category. Uh, and for most of human history, it wasn't actually what made one mountain matter more than any other. Thank you.